We're fortunate that our third speaker is here. So I'd like to introduce him, Jay Geed from the National Institute of Mental Health. I thought I was going to make it on time, and then I ran into all the traffic. I thought, wow, how many people are coming to this conference? <laughs> and then I found out that some sporting event accounted for part of the, <laughs> the traffic. Um, but I'm so glad to be here and to see many, uh, many friends and uh, hopefully uh, new ones. So I'm going to be talking about the adolescent brain. And the key point I want to convey is that it's not broken. It's, it's, um, it's not the same as a child brain or the same as an adult brain, but um, its features have, have served us well. Um, and particularly in terms of behavioral features, the big three that are found not only in human adolescents, but in all social mammals, are um, greater risk-taking, sensation-seeking, which sounds the same, but it's subtly different, and a move away from parents toward peers. And I think the fact that these three things are so um, ubiquitous across species really um, underscores the uh, uh, depth of, of the biology for these things and we're probably not uh, well served to try to change these behaviors or to eliminate them. Um, more a matter, I think, of uh, keeping them non-lethal um, or, or even harnessing them uh, for good. Um, so these, these uh, three, three changes I think also have an underlying neurophysiology and neuroanatomy um, that I'll talk about when the, when the slides uh, come up in just a moment here. But one of the um, features um, in terms of our evolutionary past was that the brain size increased some uh, time between 500 and 800,000 years ago. And looking at a relationship between climate change and this increase uh, what I found surprising was that it wasn't the harshness of the climate that was related to the last big increase in brain size. It was the variability or the fluctuations in climate. Um, and so before seeing uh, this data I'm just about to show, I thought, you know, the colder it got, the harsher the conditions got, only the toughest and most clever could survive. Um, but it turns out that that's not the driving force, was actually the change itself. Um, and so I think that this idea of change in terms of, of everybody in this room had teenage ancestors who were very good at adapting um, and being able to uh, adjust to different uh, changes in the climate. And this is in fairly stark contrast to Neanderthals, whose brains were actually about 13 percent larger than ours um, and survived very you know, harsh uh, conditions, even harsher um, than, than most humans, but they didn't uh, have a, a plan B. Their tool use hardly changed at all for about 200,000 years. Um, and based on uh, dental records, they can tell an enormous amount, which it turns out, from, from fossilized teeth, they didn't really have teenagers. I mean, they had, you know, adolescents, but, but it wasn't during the teen years. Um, and so by about age 11 or 12, um, if you found a Neanderthal tooth, they're more likely to be with their children than their parents. Um, and so this is a, I'm sorry, I wanted to get started, but it's not wasting any more time, but I just, uh, when I tell people I'm going to talk about the teen brain, I get comments like short talk, uh, <laughs> they found one, contradiction of terms. Uh, theme of search for the elusive, right? So, but but only, only as a prelude to say this is wrong, I mean, in terms of that, you know, teens uh, do have brains and, and that they're not broken. So the, the jokes are just sort of a setup to, to, this, to this point. These three um, uh, behavioral um, features that have been uh, written about by, by Linda Sphere, the idea is that they get us out of the home, uh, which is not particularly a rational thing. People love us and feed us and protect us and take care of us. Why do we ever leave? And in the U.S., and, you know, it's, it is uh, a fairly large percent, 30 percent of college students uh, live back at home for at least one year. I'm not saying that's wrong, but I mean, it's being extended, and that's, I think, part of the, the story here. But the idea was in terms of, you know, to the people that did this, um, to take this kind of risky move of leaving home, it 
that prevents inbreeding uh, is better, better for us as a species. Here, here is the panel re, um, <coughs> relating climate change to brain size that I mentioned uh, earlier um, in terms of the degree of variability in climate size, not the harshness is what has correlated. That's always speculative to, to take this, this too far. Um, and, and the Neanderthal um, uh, uh, te teeth. Um, and so this idea that um, why we are here and Neanderthals aren't, despite a bit of uh, mixed, mixed reading, uh, is that we had this bizarrely protracted period um, of development, way longer than any other species, this complete, you know, off the map outlier, um, well, in, well into the second decade. Uh, and the trade off is, is that we don't lock and load. We don't have to kind of finish specializing uh, the brain until we have a better sense of what the environment is. And there are downsides to that. There's lots of trade offs, but this is the basic uh, bargain for our species this bizarrely long, protracted period of protection from our parents, uh, which allows us then this incredible flexibility for our brain to specialize in all you know, kinds of different environments. Uh, and, and one I wanted to touch upon is this you know, digital revolution, digits <coughs> being one and zero um, in terms of what we're doing right at this moment and how much of our time is spent with computers and screen time and uh, you know, digital information. Um, being the ones and O's, which I think uh, when we look back, we'll, we'll realize this, it really truly is a revolution. I don't think that's hyperbole in terms of uh, dramatically changed the way that we learn, the way that we play, and the way that we interact with each other. Um, and I've been uh, interested in this relationship between the teen brain and digital technologies. Um, not so much because only teens are affected, you know, all ages uh, are being touched by uh, iPads and you know, Facebook and those, those sort of things. But adolescents, I think, are particularly interesting because they're old enough to master these technologies, but young enough to embrace these changes. Um, so that's, that's been my more recent area of interest in terms of trying to understand as an adolescent psychiatrist um, you know, their world a bit. So the amount of uh, screen time is, is going up and up. This is from the Kaiser Foundation. The, the 2012 uh, data now is about 11 hours and 45 minutes uh, because of mostly mobile devices. People are using more and more. And about a third of the time when people are using one device, they're using at least one other. So you're doing your homework while you're listening uh, to iTunes, while you're on Facebook. Um, maybe if we could turn the audio up on those, but these, these are twins that have been in our study since they were age four, and they're both in, in college now. Um, and just sort of reviewing kind of their not very atypical lives, you know, of, of uh, being pretty much online most of their day um, in terms of for their homework, for their social life, for all the things that they do. And again, this is, you know, they're great kids. They, you know, have friends. They got into the college of their choice. So this isn't unusual. Uh, anymore in terms of this total amount of time, uh, you know, spent yeah, multitasking. So one of the questions from, from uh, <laughs> I felt something. <laughs> Not sure how that one. <laughs> but the, but this idea then is like you know we can complain about it and we can say that's not the way I did it when I was that age and you know they need to get out a book and stuff like that. But this this genie's out of the bottle. Right? I mean we're not we're not going to change this. We, I think we need to understand it. Um, and and like most interesting questions. The answer to this is, you know, it depends. Um, so I think that there are, are positive aspects in terms of, of uh, education, and there are negative aspects. I mean, the upside is it's incredible what's online. Right? The greatest minds on our planet, you know, a couple clicks away. TED Talks, the Khan Academy. I mean, it's just you know, phenomenal for free. I mean, somehow it, it, you know, it went in that direction. It probably could have been monetized, um, but it's not. The trouble is there's so much information, how do you tell the signal from noise? And that's what I think needs to be taught in schools, and it's not. We're still kind of focusing on memorizing facts and figures, which anybody with an iPhone can, can figure out in 30 seconds. So I think we have this, this gap between the, what students are going to need and, and what's out there. Um, there's this notion that it's all a mile wide and an inch deep because it's so fast, people don't have discipline anymore, they're going to just be shallow. I think that can happen, um, but it doesn't have to. You can actually dig quite deep, quite quickly, um, you know, if you are savvy about using uh, the internet. Um, 
uh, play. I used to be sort of, well, it's just their couch potatoes. They're not exercising, they're not running, jumping, and playing uh, like we did. But now with Connect and Wii Fit and stuff, these games can be incredibly active, you know, as active as you want to make them. You know, they're, they're scalable. And so that fundamental argument is also gone. Um, people worry about you know, like sexual content, the trick being not to find it, right? If you're on the internet, you know, the ads and stuff. Um, and violence, the m amount of time spent playing violent video games has gone up fourfold since 2002. And the degree of violence is limited only you know, by our imagination. Both of the recent data from 2010 and 2012, unwanted teen pregnancy, sexually transmitted disease, is a 47 year low. Real world crime, 49 year low. Puzzling, right? Uh, uh, you could, you would, if it was the opposite, we'd be all over this. Right? This is corrupting, you know, the moral fabric of our nation and such. So I'm not sure. I mean, I think that the data, you know, are compelling. You know, maybe people say, well, they're not mugging you because they're in their basement, you know, playing these games. You know, and, you know, maybe or maybe it's something deeper that they're working out. You know, these fundamental issues of of our human condition. But but I think it is interesting in this disconnect between the exposure and um, I think is very real. There is desensitization, you know, the amygdala dampens down with repeated exposure, but real world violence isn't, isn't following suit. Uh, social interaction, a quarter, 25% of all internet traffic is social media, you know, Facebook and such. And, and it's incredible, you know, the amount of time and, uh, and traffic. So, you know, again, is this good or bad? We're sort of built our brains to interact with each other, to smell and touch and share the same, all these things, a huge percent of our, of our brain is dedicated to this. Are we losing something by having digital, um, digital only? Don't know. Um, does take lots of time. It's more fun than homework. Um, one aspect that, that does look to be promising is this idea of a global community. So we all laugh at the same cats playing the piano or sharing the same YouTube things. And, it, and it's binding. We, we've, you know, we realize we're a lot more alike than different. Um, a lot of prejudice, I think, is, is ignorance and about other cultures. We see they're very much like us. They love their kids and their family, and they want to do well in the world. They might have different clothes or customs or foods or you know, religions. Um, but when we look at 19-year-olds versus 23 versus 17-year-olds, 27-year-olds, they are more globally minded. They know more about what's going on in the world, and they, they tend to have a uh, you know, broader perspective. So this could be a, a very positive aspect of all this. So this is a quote from my, my grandmother, though. It, you know, it just ain't natural, right, you know, for us to be spending so much of our day with, you know, digital devices. And, and, and that may, you know, it may be valid, but I'd also point out reading's not natural either. So reading's only 5,100 years old. For most of our, you know, time here, nobody read. And, and so I think that that's not a valid argument in terms of 10,000 years ago, we were you know, hunting, gathering berries, and so think of how much of our, our day now is spent with uh, the written word or you know, um, symbols and, and, and such. So I don't think fundamentally by itself that you know, being unnatural is, 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 uh, is the whole story. So I think the, whole, the story is, though, I think, this plasticity. This, this very long time when the brain um, it can still specialize based on education or, or environment. Um, and it creates, I think Ron was the first person who uh, phrased this at your conference, this idea of time of both opportunity and vulnerability. Um, and, and that's basically my, my career, is trying to understand the good and bad um, of this by using imaging, genetics, and behavioral analysis to follow the path, um, importantly for this kind of the mechanisms. And, and I, I, I think most of us would agree we're just getting started on mechanisms, right? We have a long way to go between understanding the mechanisms of brain development and the influences for, for good or ill. Very non-creative study design. People come to the lab um, uh, starting now right after birth or even in, in the womb, come back at two intervals. We get imaging, uh, genetics, uh, DNA from blood, saliva, or skin, uh, evolving battery of psych testing. A quarter healthy singletons, a quarter healthy twins, and, and half from clinical groups. So I'm going to go right to the, the punchline because I wanted to stay at, at 15 minutes. Um, the brain doesn't mature by getting bigger and bigger. Okay? By age six, it's already 93% of adult size. Um, that was initially quite devastating, frankly, when we were starting out, we're going to watch the brain grow, and it's this big, you can do arithmetic, oh, this big uh, algebra, now this big, you know, calculus. 
And it just you know, doesn't work that way. It matures by becoming more specialized and by becoming uh, more interconnected, which Christian just you know, touched upon, and, I, and Damien's work as well. I mean, a lot of this work and the idea of how is the brain connected amongst itself. So if the different brain parts are like letters of the alphabet, the letters become words, the words become sentences, the sentences paragraphs, that's how the brain matures, not by growing you know, um, more parts or, or, even, uh, or even bigger parts. Um, as, as B.J. Casey has written eloquently about, a lot of the behavioral manifestations might be seen through this lens of late maturing prefrontal cortex and earlier maturing uh, limbic system. Um, lots of nuances around, around those themes. Um, this is what um, the brain looks like to an MRI machine. It sees these cubes of white and gray. Um, they're usually about a millimeter per side. You can get them a bit smaller with more powerful magnets that we've just heard about as well, or longer time in the scanner. But most of the real literature is about this size, with uh, gray being the shown here in turquoise, the cell bodies, the dendrites, terminal branches of axons, white matter being the myelin. And just as a reminder of um, what we're looking at in terms of inside each of these cubes, and we have three kilometers of axons, 90,000 neurons, four and a half million synapses. And so there's this irrational appeal to reduce the wonderful complexity of us to um, aesthetically pleasing pictures. Um, this sort of certainty is very alluring to the judicial system, to clinicians. Let's get the diagnosis. Let's not have to you know, talk to the child and their teacher and their family. It's too messy. Let's just you know, get a, a beautiful picture. Only, only if, right? If, we, if, it, if it worked, that would be great. It doesn't. Um, and this is part of the reason why. We, we're, we're, not, um, you know, we're not at the kitchen tables. We're looking down from an airplane at the city. We can see the major shopping areas, the business centers and stuff, but we're not you know, at the level of synapses. So it's very, uh, I think, a good precaution at the beginning of a meeting to keep in mind that these, uh, these pictures are, are, not, uh, um, you know, are not reading minds and they're not uh, um, as precise as they sometimes uh, are thought to be. So a lot of work will be how to look deeper inside of these boxes. Um, many people in this room doing this kind of work. <coughs> so in, how am I doing on time? I have two minutes? Okay. So I'm just going to hit you know, the absolute highlights then of what happens to gray matter, um, which um, increases during childhood, hits a peak, and then decreases um, uh, throughout adolescence. This is the notion of specialization, and this is, you know, this is a leap in terms of this you know, kind of speculative interpretations about what's actually happening. Um, there's some evidence that if you actually look at this closely, there's precious little actual data in adolescence. This is a very often used and cited uh, graph, though, in terms of looking at not only gray matter density, but a number of synapses. Um, uh, dopamine receptors, but also norepinephrine, serotonin. It's kind of a fundamental principle. Overproduce, duke it out, fight it out. Um, only the strongest survive a way of, of creating complexity. Um, some of you have probably seen this before. If you've seen me talk, this idea of the prefrontal cortex being particularly late to um, turn blue. Um, which very indirectly you could look at it as maturation, but not till about age 25. This is one of the original surprises that the brain is still you know, under construction um, you know, well throughout the, the second decade into the third. Um, and I think this is often overinterpreted, but this notion, I think, of, of um, extended uh, time of development is, is one of the um, aspects that, that has drawn a lot of attention in terms of, of the. Uh, capacity to change. Again, it's a good thing you know, for, for a species. Um, and the white matter, um, uh, so just to, to go through this part quickly, the prefrontal cortex is involved in lots of things that we'll um, hear about throughout the, the, the meeting in terms of running different counterfactuals in our mind. We can say, what if I do this action or what if I do that action? And we can do it in our head instead of the real world. The philosopher uh, Karl Popper put it very nicely, our hypotheses die in our stead. Um, and as we go from a baby to a teenager to a young adult to our 30s, we, we get better and better at running these uh, different scenarios in, in, in our mind. Sorry for flashing these forward. All the slides, if anybody wants them, are freely available. 
Um, this is uh, Dr. Casey's work again showing this mismatch between the early maturing limbic system and later maturing prefrontal cortex with the gray zone being the key. So it's not just a matter of the prefrontal cortex maturing late or else you know, children would have all, all, the, tr all the troubles. This is the changes in dopamine. I'm going to just fast forward ahead to the, the, the white matter um, aspects because um, you know, I think this has been uh, the more recent focus. And, and as opposed to the gray matter, which goes up, hits a peak, and comes down, white matter is sort of up, up, and away during this time. Probably in like the fifth decade for women, the, the fourth for men, so well beyond this period. And this is that notion then of connectivity of the brain becoming more interconnected, which the graph theory and network approaches will, 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 help, will help tease out. So through, through all of this, um, the, these changes, most teens do okay. They get through this, they become responsible, you know, well-functioning uh, adults. Um, but the prolonged uh, plasticity, um, I mean, plasticity never stops. We have it you know, from in the womb through uh, death. But in terms of it is a trade-off because uh, white matter releases molecules that prevent further arborization. So we do, it's not sort of you know, steady throughout. But this period of prolonged plasticity is both an uh, opportunity for us as parents, as teachers, as clinicians, as, as people, uh, but also has vulnerabilities for psychopathology. I'm going to stop there and um, look forward to the panel discussion uh, for more details. Thanks.